Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second part of our guest speaker series in relation to fostering research integrity. My name is Sean Lacey. I am the university's uh, research integrity and compliance officer, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. Mara Heine, adjunct professor of research integrity at the University College uh, Dublin. Mara is uh, one of our second speakers. So uh, earlier this month, we had Dr. Daniel Pizzolato, who spoke of uh, his research studies and findings of these in relation to fostering research integrity applicable to both students, supervisors, and also institutions as well. But today, Moira is going to be uh, speaking on implementing integrity in our research practice. And maybe just to give us a proper introduction to Moira. So Moira is an adjunct professor, as I said, at the University College Dublin, working with the research culture team. Previously, she was a senior manager at the Health Research Board. She's been involved in advancing research integrity policy for many years, is treasurer of the World Conference on Research Integrity, Foundation Governing Board, co-chair of the eighth World Conference of Research Integrity, which is taking place in Athens in, uh, in June next year. And Mara is a board member of the Embassy of Good Science. Mara is a chair of ALIA uh, Permanent Working Group on Science and Ethics and co-authored the ALIA European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity in 2017 and 2023. She sits on several EU policy and stakeholder advisory boards for EU projects researching research integrity and ethics issues. And today, Moira will present on implementing research integrity in your research practice, international policies, and procedures. Over, over to you, Moira. And you're just on mute there, just when you do share your screen. Uh, screen okay, then. thank yep. you. Uh, no problem. Rookie mistake. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, so share. Please work. Uh, all right, and I need to go back a slide. Well, actually, I don't really. Um, so I just want to get rid of this. It's in the way. Okay, so I am really honoured to be asked by Sean to talk to you today. Um, it, it's great to see what's happening around Ireland uh, because that was my initial focus was the Irish research system. Um, but over time, it became obvious that actually we can't work in isolation, that we need to be aligned with what's happening at a European and global level. So that kind of was what pushed me to move in a little bit more to the European stuff. But anyway, I just today I'd like to cover with you just kind of general policy objectives. Uh, as Sean mentioned, the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity. Uh, there's also some interesting guidelines by the European Network of Research Integrity Offices, uh, UK Research Integrity Office. There's some really interesting stuff happening in publications. Uh, Daniel probably talked to you a little bit about the SOPs for RI toolbox, but I'll just mention it again. And um, again, the World Conferences on Research Integrity have produced some really nice statements. And there's also a lot of outputs well worth looking at in some of the European research on research integrity projects. And I suppose finally, uh, the coalition to reform research assessment, I'll just vaguely mention or quickly mention that, and the embassy of good science, and then not forgetting that we also have some Irish national policies. So, I mean, I suppose in terms of people's behavior and research integrity and all of that kind of carry on, you know, there's been a lot of work done on what actually influences behavior. And that includes, I mean, the old publisher perish, so publication pressure to get, you know, increase the number of papers, but increase them in high impact journals, increase your citation rate, et cetera, et cetera. So that certainly does put a lot of pressure on people. But also, unfortunately, there are uh, there still isn't really enough by way of training in how to mentor and supervise people. Uh, in either PhD students or postdocs or even colleagues. And there's a lot of poor role models out there still. Um, the career stage, uh, you're much more vulnerable, let's say, to questionable research practices at an early career stage rather than a later one. So when you're really just trying to get up that ladder. Um, fear, th that definitely is an issue. Um, and that could be fear of... Uh, telling your PhD supervisor that the experiments didn't work when they're actually looking to publish a paper on the results of those experiments. Um, 
ambition. Certainly for more senior researchers, ambition has been shown to be one of the factors that might drive them to fabricate or falsificate their data. Um, there is still a lack of really robust training uh, in not just research integrity and ethics, but also in kind of methodology, experimental design, statistical analysis, etc. So that can definitely influence uh, how people um, analyze, process, report their data. Um, there's massive competition in the system. I mean, we all know that, you know, the very steep, steep triangle to professorship uh, it really puts a lot of pressure on people. And finally, there are really some also some negative incentives. Um, and some of those include things like world rankings for institutions where they want their researchers, they're putting pressure on the researchers to get published and to get their kind of uh, position in the world rankings up. Um, so over the last, uh, well, 2006, the, uh, there have been so many global uh, research integrity codes developed. And this is a really interesting paper that a colleague of mine in UCD, um, it's been accepted for publication in accounting and research. And what it does is it looks at it maps out all of the codes globally when they actually turned up and what they cover. So it's a, it'll be a really interesting paper to get your hands on when it comes out, hopefully in the new year. But the problem with all of these codes is keeping pace with changes in the research landscape. And the changes are fast and furious. Um, I mean, I, I've in the slides I've given to Sean, I have a much more detailed um, description of the changes that are happening. But just for the sake of time here, I've picked out some of the major ones. And certainly one is that the focus is shifting. The focus of, let's say, both blame and uh, incentivization, <clears throat> excuse me, is shifting from the individual researcher to the whole system and to try to avoid counterproductive incentives. Um, and that goes for the funders as well as the institutions, for the funders in the decisions they make around funding um, and for the institutions in how they approach recruitment and promotion of researchers. Um, and, and I suppose leading on from this, then there's a, a growing recognition of the importance of research culture. So the environment within which you work in enabling research integrity and good practice. And um, there's been a lot of new technological developments have arisen in the last couple of years, especially in things like human technology interfaces and AI applications. And those are throwing up some really interesting ethical and integrity challenges. And um, new publishing models have uh, certainly since about 2017, they've really taken off, especially with the drive to try to make publications open access. And there again, there's an increased demand also, not just for the publication, but for the underlying data to be made available in open format. And that can be really challenging for people. Um, and also people are much more au fait with social media tools, you know, such as blogs and using uh, X, as it's called now, to uh, disseminate their outcomes. But of course, those tools operate outside of the peer review system. So we need to be very careful about them. And finally, um, I think one of the important things it, that has arisen from COVID is a much more science literate and interested public. And certainly uh, a survey, a very recent survey in the US showed that people want to understand the evidence underpinning the policies that actually affect their lives. So they're making demands on the system as well. So the European Code of Conduct was originally published in 2017. And the idea was that uh, there had been a European Code of Conduct kicking around since 2000, but uh, 2010. But it was a combination of ALEA and uh, the European Science Foundation, as it was the time, uh, now Science Europe. And it was a very long, very wordy, very repetitive document. So the European Commission decided, OK, we can't use that 
in our grant agreements, we need something shorter, snappier, that's amenable to translation. And we will include that then in our grant agreement. So that's why we did the original version back in 2017. But the thing is, times have changed. So we needed to revise it in 2023. And the purpose of the European Code of Conduct is that it provides a framework for self-regulation by researchers and institutions, but increasingly also by funders and by journals. And they're mentioned in the new European Code of Conduct much more clearly. And it was really important that the, the language would be clear, would be unambiguous, because this code has been translated into all the European languages, so the 27, plus Arabic, Japanese, Chinese and Turkish that I know of. There may well be other languages there as well. So, you know, you don't want people struggling to interpret what exactly we mean. So we gave an awful lot of consideration to the language. We also, and or at least the Commission needed us to be able to uh, apply to various stakeholders, including industry. And we did include industry in the revision process. Um, well, mainly because uh, they, they actually have a very interesting perspective. They're often ahead of the game when it comes to research integrity. And uh, of course, there is a bigger push now, both nationally and at a European level, for pu public-private funding. So really, everybody needs to be talking the same language in terms of research integrity. We also wanted it to be able to apply across disciplines and ultimately, ultimately that it would be suitable as a, a requirement in the Horizon Europe grant agreements. Um, we'd said we'd revise it every three to five years. It's actually been six years, but that was COVID. You can thank for that, the last two years. So it would have been done in about four years otherwise. And we looked at all of these changes. And as I say, there's a slide in the uh, slide you'll get, which will be much more detailed. Um, about what those changes are. And there's a link there to that. Um, basically, the code is based on four principles, honesty, reliability, respect, and accountability. And to a certain extent, those are meant to follow the trajectory of research. So in terms of honesty, it's around kind of thinking about the research that you're going to do, developing your research idea, but also then undertaking it, reviewing it, reporting it, and that you try to be uh, fu as fully transparent, fair and without bias as you can possibly be. In terms of reliability, I mean, this is really the how I do research uh, principle, if you like. So you really are trying to ensure the quality of your research through good design, good methodology, good analysis. And this is where the training comes in and also the proper use of resources so that you're not, you know, getting a good grant and then using it for something else completely. Um, in terms of respect, uh, this speaks very much, I suppose, to the ethical and moral mindset of researchers. So it's respect for colleagues, but also for research participants and subjects, uh, such as you know, animals or tissue that from collected from participants, also their data, which is very important, uh, but also respect for society. So, you know, thinking about the impacts of your research on society, for ecosystems, for cultural heritage, for the environment. So you, you really need to kind of look out into the world to think about the possible impacts of your research. And you are also accountable for your research. And why we might be moving away from kind of blaming individual researchers to looking at the research system, individual researchers are still accountable for their research ideas, for how and where they publish, for the management of the research, the management of the data, for the training and supervision and mentoring, very importantly, of their students and their postdocs and also for uh, thinking about those wider societal impacts. So uh, these aren't exhaustive principles, by the way, but uh, I suppose they do provide an opportunity for policies and guidelines that are derived from them to also identify other principles that would be relevant in a particular context. It covers eight interlinked areas of practice, uh, starting in the middle there with the research environment that is becoming so important now 
but also looking at really what good practice would look like in terms of data protection and management, publication, training, the actual research procedures themselves, collaborative working, review and assessment and the responsibilities of research there and the safeguards that you put in place around the research and the participants. It also looks at research misconduct and questionable research practices and has uh, actually slightly changed the definition of fabrication, falsification and plagiarism. Uh, well, not so much plagiarism, but fabrication and falsification. And in fabrication, it now includes, and in falsification, sorry, as well, it includes data and images because there are two things that have become problematic. And especially with the rise of AI, where you can simply generate a whole clinical trial uh, that never happened. So that's quite worrying. And there also are uh, quite a few new questionable research practices mentioned because you know people are endlessly creative about how they might uh, uh, queer the research in some way or other and have poor practices. Um, and then the violations of uh, how to deal with violations of good research practice. There's also some kind of guidelines there for institutions. Um, but there, you know, the European Code of Conduct isn't the only game in town. There are lots of other useful uh, European codes and guidelines. And I just wanted to run you through a few of them. So, the, as I mentioned, the European Network of Research Integrity Offices, they've actually produced two really interesting documents, kind of practical guidelines for research integrity officers. But for anybody really who is interested in this area, the first was recommendations on how to investigate a case of research misconduct. And that arose because the research integrity officers themselves were struggling a little bit, but they also realized that the institutions they were dealing with were also struggling a little bit with how to go about investigating misconduct and what you need to think about. So they produced this very nice handbook and it's based on hard experience by them. More recently though, they've also produced a really nice handbook on the protection of whistleblowers in research. And uh, both of those are available, so you can see the links below. Um, and the whistleblower protection uh, is absolutely critical because to be honest, most of the cases of misconducts that arise, arise because of whistleblowers. Somebody who sees something that they're really not comfortable with uh, and what do they do with that information? So this is about um, trying to protect those people as they make their way through the kind of um, investigative system. Um, UK Rio also, I'm very fond of these, uh, the UK Rio website because it is just stuffed full of useful guidelines and checklists for both researchers themselves, but also for the institutions. So there's, they've just published a really nice checklist on a uh, good research practice. So, and that's very much for researchers. It's like, have I, you know, have I done a data management plan? Have I appropriate training? Have I, have I, have I? So it's just a way of kind of checking in with yourself and perhaps also with your team. Um, they have loads of really nice case studies around misconduct. So uh, if you were thinking of pulling together a training course, they've got some very nice case studies you could use. They've got a very interesting webinar series looking at all sorts of aspects of research integrity with really good speakers, really knowledgeable speakers. They've also more recently kind of moved into looking at research culture. So they were involved in a big survey in the UK um, asking uh, researchers how they felt the culture was for them. And there's some nice infographics and publications out of that. And again, they've got some excellent guideline documents around how to do a misconduct investigation. They've got a really practical toolkit for integrity. They talk about guidelines for authorship, how to retract, et cetera, et cetera. So if you never looked at anything else, this is a fantastic resource for people. Um, but of course, publication is where an awful lot of the difficulties arise. Um, and I think that the Committee on Publication Ethics guidelines on good publication practices and authorship and contribution and how to resolve disputes, et cetera, et cetera, are really interesting. And um, they're more intended for uh, journal editors 
But I think it's very important to understand how the journals are thinking about this so that when you're uh, submitting uh, an article for publication, you're lining up with the kind of things that they're going to be checking. There was also a very interesting report done in, uh, last year by the Inter-Academy Partnership. Um, and what they were looking at was the, uh, the rise in the use of predatory journals, uh, academic journals, conferences, and also uh, some of the services that people are using now to write papers at, uh, and that kind of thing. And what they tried to get under the skin of was what drives people to use these predatory services? How can you even identify them? So how do you know if a journal is exhibiting predatory behaviours? And they actually provided detailed recommendations on how to implement them. But I think a very useful take home from them was this figure. And what this is trying to get into people's heads is the kind of things you need to look out for when you're considering a journal. So these are the kind of markers of uh, an excellent journal. You know, they've got really good peer review. They have a very strong editorial board. Um, they mention perhaps research integrity on their website. They have a process for retractions. And um, they're very clear about their publishing costs. Um, they may occasionally engage in predatory practices, but if they find that that's happening, if one of the editors, for example, is doing something funny, they take action. Um, and then there are markers for the kind of journals you absolutely do not want to be using. So ones that are using kind of aggressive and uh, indiscriminate sol sol solicitation practices. So I get um, emails all the time saying, hey, publish in our journal, we're doing a special issue on. For me, that's a really big red flag. So I suppose think before you publish. Think, check, publish. It would be my advice there. Um, then I, I Dan, um, Daniel uh, Piazzola probably talked a little bit about the SAPs for our I toolbox. But again, I mean, this is a rich, rich resource for anybody who's interested in research integrity. And what they're saying is, you know, it'd be a really good idea for institutions, but it could also be at a departmental level, for example, to develop a research integrity promotion plan. So they did an awful lot of work about, well, what should be in that? And so they developed a load of tools for uh, research performing organizations, but that would equally go for departments and schools, lots and lots of guidelines and templates. And they also did the same, interestingly, for research funding organizations, because they were saying, well, hold on a second. It's all very well for the funders to say, we want you, you know, we have these expectations of you, but they also need to look at their own practices and make sure that they are robust. Um, and what I suppose there's a they did a nice article in Nature called From Talk to Walk, the Development of Research Integrity Promotion Plans. And what they identified for institutions were, were nine topics. So the research environment, obviously, supervision and mentoring, training, uh, what kind of ethics structures are in place, how do you deal with breaches of integrity, data practices and management, collaboration, declaration of conflicts of interest and publication and communication. So you can see there that actually, uh, with the exception of declaring declaration of interest, which is in fact under uh, research processes, these are the same headlines that you've got in the European Code of Conduct. Um, another kind of interesting source if you're interested, I suppose, in the evolution of policy around research integrity since 2007, let's say, um, is the World Conferences on Research Integrity. They have a really good website, but what they've done is for most of their conferences, for five so far, and there'll be a sixth one now in Athens next year, they have produced kind of statements um, taking a particular policy issue. So in Singapore, back in 2010, uh, where everybody was still not 100% sure whether they had a problem with research integrity, et cetera. And if they did, like what were the principles around that? So the Singapore statement, which is very highly used, uh, set out globally agreed principles for research integrity. 
these are not identical to what's in the European Code of Conduct, because in fact, some of the principles in the Singapore statement aren't really principles. They're more processes. So they've been absorbed under different headings in the European Code of Conduct. The Montreal Statement, if we move on to 2013, three years later, um, there was a huge rise in the amount of collaboration that was happening across sectors, across borders. So cross-boundary, let's call it, collaboration. So the Montreal Statement was trying to tackle some good principles and recommendations there. The Amsterdam Agenda was talking about uh, research on research integrity. So how, do, where, what evidence do we need to improve the situation? What evidence do we need to move on the open access discussion, etc.? And, you know, I think that was also, it, it helped a lot in terms of the EU thinking about research on research integrity and funding this. The Hong Kong principles in 2019 were right on the button because the discussion now has moved to assessment. How do we assess researchers fairly and try and get away from the quality over quantity, or sorry, quantity over quality, and really move towards more qualitative assessment of researchers to try and remove some of the perverse incentives that are there. And finally, the Cape Town statement in 2022, uh, no surprise, it was in Africa. So obviously they were thinking about things like equity in research, uh, diversity, inclusion. But the thing, is, and it's a really nice statement actually with lots of good recommendations, but equity, diversity, inclusion apply everywhere. It's not just in Africa. So as I said, the EU has been for since uh, Horizon 2020 funding integrity and ethics projects, really interesting ones. And there are huge, uh, oh, I mean, massive amount of outputs. But, you know, uh, if you're if you have the time and you're interested, it's well worth looking at because it covers lots of different areas. Uh, first of all, education. So there's a by the way, if there isn't a, a link associated with these projects, it means that the project is only starting and they haven't actually got a website up and running yet. So there have been, you know, at least five projects on different uh, approaches to training of uh, researchers, training the trainers, moving back to secondary school students, moving beyond the concept of biological, trying to figure out what's the best way to do training and get evidence for that. Of course, since COVID, there's been a lot of discussion about trust in science. So there are three different projects doing work on that. Uh, the ROSI project has produced some excellent uh, toolkits, frameworks, etc., around open science. Um, in terms of infrastructure, the entire project was all about developing the Embassy of Good Science. And as I said, the SOPs for RI project was all about developing tools to help people uh, develop research integrity promotion plans. I did mention that there's been lots of different uh, discussions around new technologies and new approaches to research, such as participatory research, uh, citizen science, etc. And there are quite a few projects there. And the Reef for Green one, which will start in January, is looking at research integrity in climate research, which is really quite interesting. And then finally, of course, the old chestnut reproducibility and there are lots of um, questions about what actually reduces the reproducibility and the re replicability of research. So these three projects are looking at different elements of that. Um, I mentioned that there is a big move towards the reform of the research assessment system. And I suppose a very good example of that is COARA, which is the coalition uh, of on assessment of research, uh, I forget what the last day is, you might know it, Sean. Um, and this is a Europe-wide movement. Uh, it was sparked by Science Europe and the European Commission, but loads of funding agencies, universities, et cetera, et cetera, have signed on to the commitments that are set out in the Quara document. And it's very much about trying to use metrics responsibly uh, in recruitment, in promotion, uh, in all sorts of assessment uh, and, you know, moving towards narrative CVs, 
um, really trying to move away from the, the bean counting approach of high impact journals, citations, number of papers, etc. This is going to take a while, though, because this is quite a, a lot to ask of the universities and the funders. Um, and I mentioned the Embassy of Good Science. Again, this is just a fabulous resource. So you can have, oh, there's all sorts of different themes covered, loads, hundreds of resources. The community is actually the uh, EU projects. So you don't have to go looking to find the links. They're there as well. And there's some fantastic training materials. So they cover, as I say, principles, they cover good practices, they cover misconduct under themes, they've got case studies, educational materials, scenarios, guidelines in uh, resources. As I say, community is around the EU projects and uh, there is just some fabulous training materials there. So not forgetting Ireland, we've got some pretty important policy documents as well. Uh, in 2021, we updated our national policy uh, on ensuring research integrity in Ireland to take account of the uh, 2017 European Code of Conduct. So we made sure that it was going to be aligned and we actually have a working group at the moment looking at a further revision of the national policy to align with the 2023 European Code of Conduct. So hopefully that will come out in 2024. And another important one was in 2022, we decided to develop some guidelines specifically to help people ensure research integrity and collaborations. And we did this with the university technology transfer offices, uh, but also with other researchers. And it's, um, it's actually gotten a lot of traction internationally because it's the only framework of its kind. So, you know, kudos to Ireland for that. Um, so I suppose with all of these policies and so on, you know, I, the question is always, can these policies actually drive behavioural change at either an institutional level or an individual level? Um, one of the difficulties, I suppose, with top-down policies and codes and guidelines etc. that try to change people's behaviours through various carrots and sticks is that what you will get is compliance with those codes and guidelines. People do it because they have to, not because they want to. That isn't what we are aiming for. We want people who are not just going through the motions. We want people who really believe that this is important and are committed to improving their own research practices. But, you know, implementing these policies and implementing changes in your own research practice doesn't happen overnight. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, I don't know, uh, I'm sure there are plenty of you remember when research ethics was the, uh, the big policy item. That took absolutely ages to really become embedded into the thinking of researchers and institutions as just an integral way of doing business. And we want to achieve the same for research integrity. Um, in your own institutions and when you're talking to colleagues, uh, think about how you're going to tell that story, the research integrity story, and how you can make people see that this actually benefits them. So there's something for them in improving their research practices. I know it sounds a bit selfish, maybe, but there you go. That's the way people think. Um, and also, I think for a lot of researchers to go, oh, no, not another policy. Oh, for God's sakes, this, I'm sick of this. But rather than thinking of these policy driven initiatives as something that is just idealistic and it's going to hamstring you, you're already really busy. It'd be great to get people to change their mindset a little bit and see these as useful tools in the armory of the research community. Um, and the thing is, if you want people to behave well, you've got to make it easy for them to behave well. So, you know, we all know that good does not always triumph over evil, but in changing how we think about these things, maybe we can make good the most comfortable place to be for a researcher. So thank you so much for listening. There is my email at the bottom and you're welcome to contact me at any point.
to uh, discuss any of these questions or topics or whatever. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks very much, Mara. That that was brilliant. There's so much material there and so many um, so many useful documents out there. Um, so I suppose just um just before we go into because there's a question there in the chat, and I have one or two questions as well, but just to say to everyone there in the room is that um the slides will be shared uh, afterwards, and you can see from Mara has been very kind to actually uh, share them with us. And in all those slides, you can see that there's a bit of signposting to various documents and they all have the links there. So that's why we didn't populate the chat with any of the links because they're all actually in the slide deck, which is uh, very good. Thanks very much, Mara, for that. OK, so there's a question then in the chat. How would you describe the state of adherence and assessment of research integrity standards prior to the introduction of the European Code of Conduct? Um, it depends on what you're talking about. I think there, well, no, I, the adherence bit is a little bit up for grabs, but certainly uh, the assessment or auditing of research integrity standards um, was something that the uh, Office of Research Integrity in the US really took on um, and ran with. Um, in Europe, I think it has done a number of things, the, the Code of Conduct. It has certainly raised the profile of research integrity in international policy discussions. And I mean, it was fantastic to get the EU on board with this and actually to get them to build it in to their grants agreements. So from an awareness raising perspective, absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think also it did... Um, it prompted the EU to really go for the research on research integrity and ethics. Um, the difficulty, I think, though, is around the metrics and indicators you might be able to use to actually monitor adherence. So, I mean, you can do surveys and they're very important. Uh, you can check that people have policies in place. You can look at um, things like the, uh, you could use the survey for, um, it's the SORC survey developed in the US, which looks at kind of the environment within departments and institutes. Um, um, and actually UK CORI, the UK Committee on Research Integrity are currently just starting a project to try and develop some indicators and metrics of the, the application of good practices. So uh, unfortunately, at the moment, it's not something we've really gotten our head around. How do we actually do this uh, easily? Uh, what are the right methods? What are the right indicators? And so on. Thanks very much, uh, Maura. For that, uh, look, that's a good question. And like, I think when you think of uh, assessment, as Maura said, there were Corara, like that's, that's not going to happen overnight. That's going to be an ongoing thing. But what's I suppose encouraging is that the discussions are happening and they're happening a lot more frequent as well. It's not like it's most meetings that you could be in or conferences on research integrity or open research. COARA does get mentioned and there's actually a national chapter in Ireland around uh, COARA and trying to implement yeah. it as well, which is uh, great to see. Um, so look, are there maybe is, is any other question? Maybe if, uh, if people in the room might want to uh, think of a question there they can put it into the chat but i've just one or two and first maybe just two points from my own point of view is yeah. firstly it was great that you were just signposting to the various resources toolkits and frameworks there it's just so good because i'd be similar to yourself i find policy i feel if policy itself should be a useful tool but then it's a case of how do we maybe implement the policy and stuff and that that those resources the NBC good science are just there's excellent resources there on, on that web page which and there's other web pages that you mentioned so thanks very much for sharing that and just my own thought then on compliance, given my own role as a research integrity and compliance officer, in my mind, it's a case of you want, you, ideally, we'd like compliance to be automatic as opposed to being enforced. And this is where people just automatically want to comply because, you know, it is the good thing to do. And I suppose how yeah. I look at doing something like that or how I look at how we can have it as automatic is by having the appropriate supports in place and the training in place. And I totally agree. Like, I mean, if it's a case of, look, you have to do this and that's it, you know, it's never going to stick then at that as, as well. That, yeah. That's my own, that's what I would find in a way. Yeah, no, and I agree with Sean. And in fact, I think the funders need to be quite important. We're speaking as an ex-funding agency person. The funders do need to be quite uh, uh, careful about this 
because they have introduced all sorts of mandatory stuff. So, you know, you won't get funding. If you don't have policies in place, you won't get funding. If you don't do training, et cetera. Uh, I mean, part of this is the carrot and stick approach. Uh, and, and that's very much the stick. And I suppose what they're hoping is then if somebody, if, if everybody does at least a basic level of training, that it might open their eyes to, oh, okay, this is something I actually need to be thinking about. Um, but I, I know we've certainly found, we did assess some of the of our policies around research integrity in at an institutional level. And what we found really was that in some institutions, at least, the, the policies were there, but there were absolutely no resources being put behind them. And, you know, I'm sorry, but you need to put the resources behind you need to have things like a research integrity officer you know you need to it needs to be very transparent on your web website what people do if they have an issue you know and even just some of the the really great i was looking at your website sean i mean there's just some really lovely um awareness raising uh you know links to tools just a, a broader uh more useful and positive set of guidelines etc so you know that doesn't happen by accident um so you do need to put the resources behind these things thanks very much thanks for mentioning the web page as it's it's a, a work in progress but i, I know agree it's, 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 it's just to have it there and you know and to be kind of keeping it up to date a question there i, I won but i just i look at the one that, that came into the chat there so mm. for a new phd student which of those resources you mentioned might be the best initial resource to point them to after our own university's quality assurance for reinforcing a research integrity from the start approach. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I would look at the Embassy of Good Science as a start off. Um, as I said, they've got some very nice kind of guidelines around good practice. Um, the... And and the case studies, actually, even just reading the case studies, I think is very helpful in getting your head on straight about where the issues might arise and what the appropriate responses to those are. So I think uh, it, there's there's no getting around immersing yourself a little bit initially uh, in what good practice actually means. And I would think also if you can get your hands on free training in methodology or experimental design and um, you know fantastic it may well be offered by MTU and um, and I, I also I know that um, Epigeum is available through MTU I mean that's a great place to start as well it's very it's basic but it, it'll get you on the right track thanks very much Maura okay so one question then my, my question will be just I suppose you mentioned in your presentation, you mentioned uh, QRP, so questionable research practices. Mm. But if we look at the European Code of Conduct, it doesn't call out QRPs. And instead in the European Code of Conduct, it calls out unacceptable research practices. Yeah. And I suppose I'd be just interested in what's your take on the link between QRPs, unacceptable research practices, and then research misconduct. Okay, so... Uh, QRPs are really unacceptable research practices just by another name. Um, QRP kind of came from the States and uh, we tried to slightly rebrand, if you like. Uh, but it, it's also, I think the, the use of the word unacceptable is important because what's acceptable in one discipline may not be acceptable in another. So I think it also allows for disciplinary variation in how people view certain practices. Uh, so I think that's really important. And actually, I heard an, an excellent talk uh, yesterday about that um, with a guy who was saying we need to get rid of the word QRP completely because, you know, it's, it's not actually serving its purpose. Uh, I think straight up misconduct I suppose the serious misconducts, the ones that are actually going to damage the research record are fabrication, falsification and plagiarism. So you're you're putting 
false information, if you like, into the research record. And even with plagiarism, people say plagiarism doesn't count. Well, actually, it does count because you're, if you plagiarize somebody else's work, you're making a claim of expertise that you don't have or that you may not have at the same level. And then you may be asked by a government department to give some policy advice, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's not only important that the data is correct in the research record, but that it's attributed to the right people. So I think that's where why plagiarism is included there. The other unacceptable practices, and I mean, we, we've called out a few uh, new ones uh, around the management of data, et cetera. Um, they're often unintended. Uh, it might be just that people haven't got the right training, um, you know, and if it's unintended, then I think training can have a huge impact in improving that situation. If, on the other hand, somebody is clearly doing, you know, the same thing over and over again, even though it's been pointed out to them that they really shouldn't be, you're then wandering into the territory of misconduct. So they are intentionally doing something to improve the look of their results or whatever, you know, uh, so you there's a, there is a little bit of a gray line there, um, but it's it's almost about volume, quantity, uh, rather than what you're doing. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it does absolutely. It does, yeah. and that's it. It's just even the way you said, look, the QRP came from uh, the states. You know, that actually makes it just even clearer in my head. Then you know, and yeah, because uh, look, I think, and what I welcomed actually personally when I saw the updated uh, European Code of Conduct is the how there was more examples, I suppose, information around unacceptable research practice, like you call out predatory journals now as mm -hmm. an unacceptable research practice, which is just very useful because we actually, in NTU, we had actually had a, a, um, a webinar only two weeks ago about identifying predatory journals and what enabled us to kind of even say, look, the reason we're doing this is because this, this is actually called out as an unacceptable research practice in uh, the European Code of Conduct. And this yeah. kind of goes back to where you would have mentioned policy is useful tools. Like that's why I do find policies in these codes are useful because yeah. they give you the reason for, well, why are we actually even doing this training? Why is everyone actually giving up their time to actually be yeah. partaking and trying to put these things into practice? Yeah. So um, yeah. No, that, and that's- We are conscious that people use the European Code of Conduct as leverage in their own institutions yeah. as well, which is important. Brilliant. Look, uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Mara. The, uh, there's no other more questions there in the chat. So just maybe just to see, look, this is Maura's presentation here was obviously part of our fostering research integrity uh, guest speaker series. And we have one more speaker, which is going to be on the 6th of December, Dr. Mikhail De uh, DeBoer, I'm an associate professor in epidemiology at UMC. Uh, and uh, Mikhail will speak on reproducible uh, practices and research as well. But uh, for now, thanks very much, uh, yeah. everyone. And... Um, We'll share the recording afterwards. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Sean. Thanks, Mara. Thank you.